What's up everyone? How are you doing today? Today is September 7th. September 7th in Brazil is the day that they celebrate their Independence Day. In the United States, we celebrate our Independence Day on the 4th of July. Basically, every country has a day where they celebrate their independence from a colonial power. Most of the time, independence from Britain. In this case, Brazil celebrates their independence from Portugal. Of course, the British were involved, as they are involved in almost everything. I will try to tell this story about how Brazil gained their independence from Portugal. It's a very interesting story, and it's a story very rarely told in English. So I will give it my best shot. I hope you like it. If you want to see more videos like this, I have a channel where I tell these kind of stories and travel vlogs and cultural commentary, a bunch of cool stuff. The link is in the description. I hope you check it out. Okay, where do I start this story of Brazilian independence? There are a lot of different places where I could start this story, but for the sake of time, let's start with Napoleon's invasion of Portugal in 1807. During the Napoleonic Wars, the Portuguese were allied with the British. And Napoleon, as you know, didn't like the British. So that kind of made Napoleon angry. He gave them an ultimatum like, stop hanging out with the British or we're gonna have beef. And they stuck with their historical BFFs. They were friends with the British. The British always had their backs. So they're like, no, Napoleon, sorry. They didn't exactly stand up and fight. At least the court didn't. What they decided to do, the court, which was led by this pretty face right here, in Portuguese, his name is Dom João Sesto. In English, we would call him maybe John the Sixth of Portugal. I think that would be the best translation. I will call him Dom João. I think it sounds a little bit better. He and his mother, who was still kind of in charge, but I think she was considered not mentally fit to run the country. So. They left Lisbon, the capital of the Kingdom of Portugal, and they brought their whole court, bunch of people, bunch of stuff, to the colonial capital of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Little fun fact, Rio is no longer the capital of Brazil, it's Brasilia, but that's another story, another video. So the whole court ferried over by the British, so the British gave them safe passage, a favor of course they're gonna charge for later, the British don't do anything for free. So they brought the whole court to Rio de Janeiro, at the time, Rio is not the same Rio we think of now. Samba, all that stuff probably wasn't going on back then. And there wasn't too much development. As the Portuguese crown really didn't let the colonies do too much of their own development. They didn't really have any universities. Almost everyone went to university back in Portugal. Not everyone. The rich people with money went to University of Coimbra, I believe is, is the name. And basically there, was, there wasn't too much going on in Rio in terms of administration and buildings. So Don Juan, he built a lot of the institutions. Uh, he built the botanical garden, a lot of different city planning and government planning, basically all the institutions a country needs, a new country needs. Portuguese crown gave that first attempt of nation building. Another thing that he did that was super important is that he opened up the ports. So in 1808, he opened up the ports to all friendly nations. Previously, Brazil could only trade with Portugal. He even made a special deal where England got a better trade deal than Portugal. I'm sure the, the Portuguese back at home fight Napoleon really liked that little deal where their king left them to fight for themselves and he gave the English a better trade deal because they helped him. So yeah, well, we could see this might cause problems down the road. Some people say independence started there when Don Juan arrived in Rio, opened up the ports, but eventually Napoleon was defeated and people started to want him to come home. Okay, you know, Napoleon is no longer here come back and run your country. And you know what? Brazil's a nice country, warm, beautiful beaches. He didn't want to leave. So he said, no, I'll stay. And in 1815, he upgraded Brazil from colonial status to a co-kingdom inside the kingdom of Portugal. So it was the kingdom of Portugal, Algarve, and Brazil. So it moved from colonial status to now it's actually its own kingdom inside kind of like Scotland and 
England or two kingdoms inside the United Kingdom, something like that. I can't really get too much into that because I don't even know exactly all the details. But anyway, so now Brazil's their own kingdom. So once you're your own kingdom, you're not going to want to go back to colonial status. Of course, there are many different interest groups. Some Brazilian states want to be independent, and we see some independence movements during this time, especially in the state of Pernambuco. And actually, even before the king got there, we have an independence conspiracy in Minas Gerais. But there's too much stuff to get into. Let's, let's stick to the story of Don Juan and his son, Dom Pedro, who I will introduce now. Eventually, things get so bad in Portugal, there is a liberal rebellion, not liberal in the sense of liberal what we think of in the United States, but liberal as in they wanted their own uh, corte, as they call it, which is uh, a, a kind of a parliament, a congress to make laws, and they wanted a constitution, they wanted free press, a lot of basic things that you would want if you were a country, and they're like, hey, someone come back here, or it's gonna get messy. Basically, this was what happened. I believe it started in Porto. Maybe no Porto because of their good fortified wine. But anyway, there was a big mess and eventually Don Juan had to go back and he left his son, 20 something year old Don Pedro or Don Peter, uh, basically in charge. Of course, he's pretty young. He likes to have fun. He's not too serious, so there are the, there are more serious administrators that are kind of controlling him, but he is left in charge. And one of the things that the court, court the parliament, so to speak, wants is for Brazil to return to colonial status. So they start sending troops back. The English are kind of running the show a little bit. Dom Juan is kind of trying to hold on to some power, but I don't think he's doing a very good job. But basically the assembly, the corte, they want to take back control of Brazil. So they send troops to take back control. They also now want Dom Pedro, the son, to come back. But on January 9th, 1822, he says, okay, you want me to come back? Everybody wants me to come back? Guess what? I'm staying, eu fico. Portuguese, eu fico. Literally, it's known as the day of the staying, dia do fico. He decides to stay, and, you know, obviously that's going to ruffle some feathers back in Portugal. There are some minor skirmishes, but, you know, people are sizing each other up for a little bit. And then on this day, September 7th, he is headed to Sao Paulo. He actually was in Sao Paulo. He, he was visiting Sao Paulo to gather support for his cause, put down any chatter about revolution against the crown. You know, he's the crown got the parliament, then you got your own separatist movement. So it's a big mess, pretty similar to basically every revolution that you will ever see. But on September 7th, he is going back to Rio from Sao Paulo, and he's by this little creek called Ipiranga. And he gets a letter, and basically the court, it's a letter from his wife, who's actually a Habsburg, Leopoldina and his number one minister, uh, Jose Bonifacio. If you want to write that down, you don't have to remember that. But basically it's saying that the court doesn't respect you and you better come home or they're going to send more troops to mess you up. So come back now to Portugal or it's going to hit the fan. Things are going to get crazy. And you know what he says? He says, no. It's called the, the cry of Ipiranga, the Grito de Ipiranga. He says, Independencia or morte, independence or death. This is what he declares, and this is the proclamation of independence. This is the official day that they celebrate, although there could be many different days, but this is the official holiday, and he's at this creek, and people say he was having stomach problems, so he was like basically having diarrhea all day, and he, he stopped at the creek to take a number two, and when he was reading this letter, and I, I can't imagine how good that scream was if you have diarrhea, but he said independence or death. And actually the biggest retail gas chain, uh, gas station in Brazil is called Ipiranga. So people still celebrate that. Ipiranga is a very important name. It's one of the first phrases of their national anthem and, and the gas chain. People make a joke now that the, the cry of Ipiranga is how expensive gas is, but that's, that's another story. 
so I could cover a, a lot more things. This is really just the beginning. A lot of times people say that this was a bloodless war, that he just said, okay, dad, um, you know, I'm not coming back. I'm staying here. And dad was like, okay, son, uh, this is not the case. There were many different fights between the Portuguese troops loyal to the Corchi and Don Pedro's troops and also some separatist movements, states that wanted to start their own state. It wasn't nearly as bloody as the other wars in Latin America. When we think of Simon Bolivar, when we think of San Martin, Bernardo Higgins, those wars were much more, you know, deadly, much more. Uh, but it wasn't without bloodshed. And I'm kind of curious of, about the whole situation between the father and the son. There's a phrase that basically I'm paraphrasing, but the father says, Brazil's gonna separate. I'd rather it be you than some crazy adventurer. So I don't know what the father actually felt about the son separating. Two years later, Portugal would eventually recognize Brazil as an independent country after some fighting, mostly guerrilla fighting, no huge battles, but certainly there were some casualties. Uh, it took certain states longer to recognize Brazil's authority or Rio's authority. Actually, they lost one of their provinces called Cisplatina. Today, you would know it as Uruguay, Uruguay. It's in the vacuum left by the Spanish crown when the Spanish king had to abdicate during the Napoleonic Wars, Brazil took back the territory, which is now Uruguay. But when Brazil declared independence, Uruguay said, hey, we want to be independent too. And I guess in the end, England kind of liked that too, because then they could treat them as an independent country and get better trade deals. So they mediated the whole independence and treaties with Portugal, with Uruguay, with Argentina. So of course, the English were happy to see this new thing that they could take, they, they could get their hands on, you know? So the original imperialists, I know people like to blame Americans and we do have our faults, but don't forget about the English. That was the quick little version about Brazilian independence. There are many more details that I could get into. It's very complicated, but I thought, I thought it was very interesting how it was kind of a father-son struggle, but also the father supported the son and they just decided that they were gonna be independent. And Brazil maintained their empire for uh, another 60 years like, until they declared a republic in 1889. But this is one of those revolutions where they changed the rulers, but the administration, the day-to-day -day life of the people didn't change too much. They didn't abolish slavery. They were the last country in all of the Americas to abolish slavery. But that's a video for another day. I hope you liked this video. If you wanna check out more videos about Brazil, check the link in the description. I'll see you next time. Peace, happy Independence Day.